So thank you for joining another episode of the Financial Literacy Network podcast. I'm Bob Stammers, and I help manage the FLN, which was organized for, to provide advice, resources, and support to CFA societies around the world interested in financial literacy and investor education, and also in supporting like-minded organizations looking for additional resources to help manage their own programs. So today, our guest is Alkis Hajitofis, CFA, a board member at CFA Society Cyprus. His bio can be found on the title screen. So Alkis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Bob. So I want to discuss the benefits and challenges that your financial literacy initiative at CFA Society Cyprus has experienced by partnering with government institutions in Cyprus. So can you give us like the 30,000 foot summary of your program and talk a little bit about the challenges of, you know, doing financial literacy in a small country like Cyprus? Sure. Right. So first off, I'll start off by saying that Cyprus is a small island nation, it's about a million inhabitants. We're located in the eastern Mediterranean, but are a member state of the European Union. Uh, as a result of the small com- country size, uh, CFA society is also relatively small compared to, let's say, some, some uh, city-wide societies in the States or North America or even in the rest of Europe. There's about 200 active members um, currently, but despite our small size, we are very active through our three subcommittees, uh, the Advocacy Committee, the Research Challenge, and of course, Financial Literacy. Uh, We began our financial literacy initiative in 2018, and we decided to focus on high school students for for the obvious reason that they've got a longer term time horizon. Of course, at a young age, you've got a greater aptitude for picking up new skills. So um, we started off by giving presentations to private schools due to the fact that it's just simply easier to arrange uh, um, a presentation to a school which has a, a school board rather than go to to the government or the Ministry of Finance to arrange something. And uh, we started that off in around 2019. So in 2019 and the 2020 academic year, we, we gave our first presentations to the public schools after we reached out to the ministry. Since then, despite COVID and despite uh, various uh, restrictions to, to making physical presentations. We've given over two uh, presentations to over two and a half thousand private and public school students, both in person and online. Our presentations normally take about 45 minutes each or one school period. And we've been met by fantastic, I mean, feedback, lots of excitement from students, from faculty and from the Ministry of Education. And, and in fact, uh, one of the student, one of the private schools that we presented to uh, back in 2018 came to us and asked us to help them develop a compulsory uh, financial literacy course for their seniors um, who were graduating high school. So we enlisted the help of a local university, the University of Cyprus, uh, in order to develop that material. And with our support, as of September 2021, a financial literacy a compulsory financial literacy course has been um, affected and is in is in place at the moment. And it's the first one on the island. And it has been kind of used as a pilot program, which um, has, uh, as of today, resulted in a further 14 schools signing up to this event. So in the last couple of months, um, along with the University of Cyprus, we've been um, going to schools, doing presentations, um, presentations to to the boards of the schools, but also presentations to students. And and it's been, as I said, met with overwhelming success. 14 additional private schools have signed up and that covers about two thirds of the private uh, private schools on the island. Um, In terms of challenges and opportunities, I think I'll start off with the opportunities. First of all, being a, a small country, like Cyprus, it's easier to to make contact with the local Ministry of Education or to reach out to other key decision makers such as central banks or the local Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, We've actually been able to make an impact on 
policies through our advisory role to the government's financial literacy um, ad hoc committee, as, as they call it, and, and suggest uh, ways forward and also by presenting the feedback that we've received from the students and the teachers uh, so far. In terms of challenges, I think uh, primary challenge is definitely the number of volunteers available. Uh, we've currently got 16 volunteers, uh, which to be fair is a large number in a society of 200. Uh, we're lucky, I would say, because as a committee, we've got a large, um, I would say, a large um, member engagement, as opposed to what I've heard from, from various other societies. A second issue I can think of was definitely developing materials. And, and this is, of course, before we discovered the Financial Literacy Network and your uh, catalog of uh, materials and presentations, which is available. But I mean, we've spent hours and hours developing uh, material, presentations, videos from scratch, and not only developing them, uh, developing them in English and also in Greek, because those are the two languages that we're presenting. Uh, and finally, funding has been an issue. Uh, literacy is not something that's really covered by the impact funding from uh, the society, and we haven't received any government grants or any third party contributions. So as a smaller society with tight budget, um, we really have to, to stretch out what we're doing. So any presentations, anything that we've been doing has been solely on uh, the society's income. And so we've, we've tried to rely as much as we can on our volunteers. Uh, had we had better funding, I'd say that we could have done maybe a financial literacy day or an event, you know, to, to attract people. That's definitely something that I would have, would have looked at. So how would you, how bad is the financial literacy issue in Cyprus? And how, how do you think it compares to, you know, other countries around the world? Well, we've, we've definitely got a financial literacy issue. Um, a poll that I saw in 2021 uh, which had around 900 people um, being polled, showed that in fact, 50% of, of those polled were financially illiterate. Uh, this is really evident in, in uh, younger participants. Uh, out of that sample, I think around 30%, only about 30% actually uh, felt comfortable taking their own financial decision. That's also quite telling. Um, furthermore, this is just something which is kind of a cultural, I'd say, issue. Uh, we've had certain financial events take place, um, which has made people hesitant to invest. Uh, and, and in fact, investing in markets isn't really in our culture. People in, people in Cyprus tend to either save in, in banks and in a CD, for example, or a longer term deposit, um, or invest in real estate just because we like to hand over and leave you know tangible assets to our to our children um and this gives rise to the fact that out, out of those people that were polled only about 60 percent has started saving for retirement and only about 40 percent of those that had started saving believed that they would have sufficient funds to cover them upon retirement age at 65 years old so uh where do we stand compared to the rest of the world I think that many larger countries have financial literacy issues, um, and I've noted this in, in um, efforts being made by the Financial Times in the UK, stating similar numbers. I think it, it just, uh, in Cyprus, it's probably something that we can deal with due to the fact that we're a smaller country and have a larger outreach as, a, let's say, a government or or, or other associations dealing with the matter. Yeah, you seem to, I mean, you seem to be making really good strides. I mean, with all the schools that you're already engaging with, I mean, the one thing about being a smaller country is you probably can make a, an impact even being a small society. So what are the, you know, what are the goals and the objectives for the program and how far along do you think you are uh, in achieving some of those? Well, our, uh, our primary goal is definitely to expand our offering. Um, this can be achieved either by offering more lessons to private schools. Uh, and that, that's something that, I mean, the government has, or, or the ministry rather, has, um, has hinted at that they would 
like us to give as many as we possibly could. However, in order to do that, we need additional volunteers or additional time for volunteers. And these are people who are full time uh, employees or business owners in, in predominantly financial services. So it's tough getting them to, to leave their jobs. They are some of the most enthusiastic people. So you, 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 you have to kind of um, try and cycle in the people that are, that are presenting. So you don't just rely always on the same people in the same city. Uh, furthermore, we could, we could expand our, our um, initiative by focusing on other target demographics middle school students or even focusing on let's say adult education such as boards or or investors uh clearly each of these options comes with its own challenge such as tailoring materials um or even navigating perceived conflicts um and engaging the targets but but once we've resolved these minor issues i think we should be good to go yeah one of the you know unique parts of your program is that you've engaged the government somewhat in helping you to you know, achieve some of your financial literacy goals. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about you know, how you've done that and how do you see them kind of fitting in with your overall um, uh, program? Okay, well, um, I think that the, the relationship with the government has been built on um, over the years, they've they've seen the value add. As I said, I mean, the first academic year, 2019, 2020, we gave five presentations to, to high schools, uh, public high schools. Um, since then, they've seen the value. They've seen that we've been available whenever they've requested. We've fulfilled any slots that they've uh, given us. And uh, the feedback that they've received from their from the, the headmasters or headmistresses uh, the students, the teachers participating has been fantastic. And so uh, the ministry has really helped us out in the last um, the last semester, I'd say. They even um, appointed an officer who is um, responsible for arranging our presentations and liaises with the schools by sharing materials and uh, time slots which are available so that our volunteers can go. Um, during the past semester, we delivered 10 presentations in uh, December across two cities on the island. We actually had two, um, two presentations that we didn't manage to get to because the communities were so uh, far from the main cities that they were snowed in and we couldn't get to them. But we, we promised to go back at a later stage, probably during the spring term. Um, in terms of how the government has um, can help us let's say in the in the longer term uh, i mentioned earlier that there's been an ad hoc committee set up to try and target financial literacy and i believe that uh, once this uh, committee uh, shifts from kind of the strategy side to the implementation side will be brought in more in order to i'd say one give more uh, presentations but also be or two, sorry, help with uh, with strategy. And I mean, a lot of this comes from the material that we use, but also from the feedback that they're given. Right. So do you see any, I mean, working with government um, could provide some risks or some conflicts. Have you run into any of those or do you foresee any risks that need to be mitigated? Um, we have received some feedback over concerns of possible conflicts of interest let's say because most as i mentioned earlier most people are employed in financial services because we're cfa charter holders and it's unlikely that we're going to be employed in some other industry um however uh i think that we've expelled these fears through the fact that our presentations are very basic we're not going out there promoting products of the firms that we work for or or even any specific asset class or strategy. I think conflicts are always something that are going to come up and the best way to mitigate it is just by sticking to material and general concepts. And, and um, yeah, I mean, people, people will be free to think what they want, but when they see the material, uh, they'll understand that we're not really promoting anything out there, uh, which is of our own. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been one of the benefits of, you know, being a CFA society is that we're agnostic when it comes to what we're, presenting since we're not selling anything and so that allows us to get into 
uh, to see people that we wouldn't necessarily be able to if we were part of a asset manager or investment organization. So um, what do you think are the most important things that you've learned about creating and managing a financial literacy program at CFA Cyprus that you think other societies should be aware of? Um, well, definitely that is a never ending task and it literally absorbs every amount of effort that you put in <laughs> and it will still not be complete. Uh, the more effort you put in, obviously, the greater the results. And, and we've been lucky on that side because our committee has a lot of member engagement. And I, and I think I mentioned that earlier. I mean, um, for anyone looking to set up financial literacy campaigns, I think about how many members and volunteers will be available to assist you. Because if you leave it down to one or two people, sooner or later, those people are going to get swamped. Um, secondly, collaboration. I mean, I mentioned earlier that we had to create material from scratch and we, we've learned it the hard way. So, I mean, we've been able to collaborate with other societies. An example would be CFA Society Greece, who, who uh, are also looking to set up a financial literacy effort. We share a common language. Um, we both speak Greek as the, the, um, the language, the main language of the country. And so uh, we were more than happy to share some material with them in Greek language, but also to provide them with some tips on how to approach the government and stuff like that. So what I would say is don't be afraid to reach out to others for help. Uh, other societies will help. The FLN is there to help you. I mean, had we had the FLN been in existence or had we known of the FLN when we were we're uh, setting up all of our materials, we would have definitely reached out to you. Um, finally, uh, I'd say, look at what others are doing regarding your target demographic. In our case, no one else was targeting high, high school students when we started. So we started small and gained some traction on which uh, others have built up on. As I said, I mean, we've got now, uh, the ad hoc committee has been set up. It was set up at, yeah, I believe, December, 2020. And uh, and it's uh, and therefore the universities have been involved. Uh, the central bank, the SEC, has been involved. But I mean, we're also seeing other the the demographic being targeted by others. So despite the fact that the space is more saturated in the last few years, we've managed to maintain relevant again through collaborations with other organisations. So uh, such as the universities, University of Cyprus is one of them, and and the ministry. By collaborating, we also remain relevant, and we're also able to still serve the target demographic. But yeah, that that's something I think that people should be aware of. That if you're trying to reach a demographic which is already pretty saturated, it might be difficult to to make some headway yourselves. One thing you mentioned that you know almost every other person that I've done a podcast with that's doing financial literacy programs have mentioned is that the membership is really excited about the subject matter and working on financial literacy. And I'm just wondering if you think that you are able to attract a different type of member. I know you only have 16 working on it right now, but do you think there's the, the possibility of attracting a different kind of member because you're providing this basically a, a different benefit for members? to work on financial literacy? I, th I think that's a very valid point. And, and yes, it's definitely true. Uh, I look at our, um, our team and we've got a very diverse team. We've got um, men and women, guys and girls who are in their 20s and people who are in their 50s. We've got some former presidents of the society, uh, former board members. We've got people who have just got their charter in the last uh, six months. And so one thing which I, I would say kind of unites all of these people is the fact that they enjoy uh, presenting to, to students or, or to people in general to get that, that dopamine effect when you see that people are, are engaged, to hear the questions that people have to ask and to answer them and see that they're really understanding it. And I think and I think that's what really drives the member engagement. We have had a lot of different people join up rather than just kind of people that were on society boards 
and just then tended to stay closer to the society because of that that prior service so we've got a lot of younger people coming in and wanting to participate and the benefit of financial literacy in terms of um, being younger and participating in it there is no end to the amount of presentations and seminars that we get invited to give so there's always a slot always an availability to write an article always the availability to go on a tv show or a podcast or something like that and speak about financial literacy so the tasks never end and so we always need people and that's why they keep coming and i think we'll keep growing the the committee as as time goes by Good. All right. Last question. So and I know you've covered this to, to some extent already, but what do you see as the, the future for the program or what's next for you guys? Um, lots of targets. Um, can start, I'll start with short term. Definitely, we need to revamp some of our materials and videos, which are in Greek and English. Um, we plan to put our material on the Society website, which we, we've recently launched an updated version in the past six months. So uh, they can be accessed and downloaded by all members. And, and I've seen that this is something that a lot of the FLM members have done, and it's, it's a great, great idea. Um, short to midterm, building more relationships. The more relationships you have, the better. So uh, relationships with financial literacy teams from other societies, both in uh, the EMEA region, Europe and Middle East and Africa, but also uh, in the FLN, maybe even joining the FLN. I mean, definitely something that I would be open to. Uh, relationships are definitely very helpful sh for sharing ideas and materials and also for finding out about what initiatives people are doing and maybe adopting some of those. In the longer term, definitely a closer collaboration with the government's ad hoc committee by being more involved in the strategic side. Uh, and secondly, identifying new demographic groups to target. As I said, uh, that's definitely something which is in our agenda and we're discussing, but I don't know how soon we can implement it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Alcas. That was really helpful. Uh, thank you for joining us and giving us some insights into working with the government institutions in Cyprus. For, uh, thank you, Bob. Oh, you're welcome. And maybe we can do this again in the future once you, you know, I'd like to hear more about, uh, you know, how your program's getting along and uh, the government engagement, I think, is a, a really interesting uh, topic for many of the societies that are doing financial literacy. So I just talked about the FLN. Um, you know, if you want to get involved with us, we have a, a LinkedIn group, which um, you can be a member of. You can also contact us on our website, which is financialliteracynetwork.org. And obviously, you're already taking advantage of uh, our YouTube channel and um, the FLN podcast. So thank you so much for joining us.